We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey, podcast listeners. Thank you again for joining us at the Artian Podcast, where we explore how art and artists drive innovation, technology development, and influence the business environment. And today, we are very happy to have with us Nico Daswani, Head of Art and Culture at the World Economy Forum. Hey, Nico. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Nia. Great to be here. Thank you. Nico, can you take a moment to introduce yourself to our listeners? <laughs> sure. I'm a cultural producer. I have worked uh, for about 20 years in the arts in different parts of the world, mostly focused on creating spaces, safe spaces, spaces of dialogue and interaction between communities of different cultures. That's been sort of the modus operandi for my career. And in the past almost eight years, I've had the opportunity of bringing some of that and mostly learning a huge amount from the context of the World Economic Forum, where most of my work revolves around creating a bridge between the cultural sector and the broader uh, sectors, other sectors of society, economic, uh, political, and, and other social sectors, so that there's a real conversation, real collaboration that is uh, holistic and where the, the cultural community can really, on the one hand, contribute to some of the dialogues and decisions that happen at the highest level, but also benefit from access and resources that exist uh, in, those, in those networks. So you mentioned the, the World Economy Forum and you are leading the art and cultural team and department. And I guess the majority of the listeners are familiar with the World Economy Forum. It's, I think, the most popular and most well-known event is the gathering at Davos. It is probably one of the most prestigious gathering for political and business leaders from around the world. You have presidents, ministers, business leaders, executives, and successful entrepreneurs all coming together. In a way, it is the gathering of elites who are mostly concerned with financial and political success. But for more than a decade now, art and culture are an integral part of the gathering. And as your role indicates, head of art and culture, it is an important part that the forum has a whole team dedicated just for that. And not only that the forum has dedicated a team for art and culture, they even appointed Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, as part of the World Economy Forum board, the first artist ever to do so. And before we kind of dive into the role of art and artists in the conference, I'm interested to hear from you, what is the, actually the role of art and culture team that you lead? <laughs> Thanks, Nir. Yeah, no, it's not always an obvious combination when you think of the World Economic Forum. Some of our events in mean, Davos is our, is our well, perhaps most well-known event, but of course we do so much more as, a, as an organization and artists, you know. And so a lot of the work that we do with my team is, is really to create those bridges. Um, very concretely, it can be, for example, in a, in a context like Davos, when you're having a, a conversation about climate change or about political instability or any other artificial intelligence is to ensure that we have a really a diverse group of people speaking on that. So that while you may have a business voice, you also have a political voice. You also have maybe someone from the cultural field who maybe has just a different approach. It could be an artist. It could be a curator. The people who look at these issues in a different ways Uh, so that so that the conversation can be enriched. So that's at the very basic level. But over time, it has grown to to be much more integrated. So we this year in Davos in January, we had the equivalent of what we call the festival, a festival where we produced exhibitions, installations, performances. We work with numerous artists. We work in collaboration with institutions like the Smithsonian, like the Natural History Museum in London. We've worked with the VNA, uh, and but we also work with, with small art organizations and artists who are up and coming. And the idea is to create moments or moments of exchange that bring some of these leaders who, you know, don't necessarily have a huge amount of time 
uh, and are not necessarily in Davos to experience the, the arts. But if we can create an experience that brings people in to a different reality, so we work with new technologies, we worked with artists who uh, created films in virtual reality, immersive work, uh, we use large scale projection mapping, uh, we use tactile environments. So we really try to make it in a way uh, an educational setting, but really grounded in, in excellence in, in artistry. And of course, all of this work is, is topical. It's, it's linked to the issues and it's aimed at bringing new conversations to bear and some of these leaders to really kind of understand these issues in a different way. And so for us, if a business leader or a world leader leaves Davos having experienced one of our exhibitions with, and leaves with more questions than answers, in a way, we've done a good part of our job there because you, you're dealing with a very, very intelligent crowd, but also intelligent because they know that they need to surround themselves with different perspectives in order to advance their work and their, and their visions of the world. So over time, this has now become a much more, I would say, from a, from a slightly more peripheral, even though you know it's been more than a decade, it's actually been more like 25 years, uh, so way predating my time, that there was already the vision to bring artists and cultural content into our meetings specifically. But now it's become a more integrated part. I am under no illusion that it's still not the reason why people will come to Davos. But I try to use that moment where we have this concentration of power, concentration of influence, concentration of media, um, to bring along with me colleagues, artists, folks from the cultural community to really engage in that moment and to contribute and to be part of spurring conversations, but also to listen. You know, I always say to my to the fellow artists, you know, if you leave Davos without having learned one thing, then that would be a, that would be a great tragedy because that you know you are not just with business leaders; you're with some of the greatest scientists in the world. You have Nobel Prize winners. We have social entrepreneurs. We have some of our young global leaders and global shapers who are under the age of thirty. We have some really, really wonderful people who come. This is really to speak more specifically about Davos as an event. And, you know, the work that we do is more holistic for the organization. You mentioned Yo-Yo Ma. You know, it was very intentional for us to, over the course of, of a long time, to make it palatable and, and uh, applicable for someone from the arts to come and be part of that very highest level conversation and the steering of such an influential institution. So we, we work on several fronts in making sure, trying to make sure that, that the arts and artists are represented within even the fabric of the institution. So on boards, on some of our working groups, some of our other boards, other initiatives that we have. And then in addition to that, we'll also use our platform, the World Economic Forum, for example, the social media platform. We have, I think, 18 million people now that follow the, follow the forum. Mm -hmm. So I really look at that as just a great tool. You know, can, yeah. we, can we use our social media to create a campaign that tells a story that an artist is telling from a community that's not usually represented? And can that be part of a broader campaign? So we try to think about all the tools, all the available resources that are part of this incredible ecosystem and how we plug in the arts and culture community. Great. It sounds exciting. Now it makes me want to visit the next time where we go after the coronavirus situation. In our previous conversation, you kind of mentioned two important roles you see you have. Create an impact and engage and touch the business leaders. Can you elaborate on that? Because as you mentioned, it's like a super sophisticated audience to get to them, to convince them, maybe to touch them. It's not an easy task. It's people that are invited and have offering for so many different realms. When we curate, we've learned. We learn from the partners that we collaborate with, these institutions I mentioned and others. But they learn also, you know, because they're used to, uh, more used to curating for a museum space where people are going to buy a subway ticket to get to the exhibition, to wait in line. None of my audience do that for my exhibitions, but they are there. They are, in a way, captive, if you want to put it that way. They're in this very small space in the context of Davos, for example. They're in this small Swiss Alpine village. And, you know, they are, are again, it's a very, very smart audience. People are, are busy and people are also very mindful when, when you're talking at them or when you're trying to make a point. Um, so for us, the curation always has to be, in a way, confounding boundaries. You know, if we were to go to an artist, and some people sometimes conflate this with international organizations or NGOs, that you will maybe hire an artist to do a piece of work on climate change. That may be great conceptually, but is the work itself, one, actually really good? I mean, as in the, the, the basics of, of the experience of, of art or an artistic experience, is the work of the highest quality, which is a prerequisite to get the attention of these busy people? 
And secondly, does it engage these folks in a place where maybe they have to live with the discomfort a little bit? Maybe they, are, again, have more questions. Oftentimes, when people curate for these kinds of spaces, there's this idea that if you just visualize a concept or if you give someone a, a beginning, middle, and the end of a story, because it's through a more creative or artistic means, that all of a sudden you've enlightened the business leader. I think it's a lot more complex than that. And we've learned this over time. And what we found oftentimes is that it's the curation of work that is really emanating from artists that understand on the one hand, understand the audience. On the second hand, are true to their form so that they are not trying to create something that reaches out of what they really know. But at the same time, they're not sort of in their own head trying to create something that we have to spend hours trying to explain to a business leader what this is about. And so the, the, the curatorial approach is, is probably quite unique because on the one hand, you need to have the excellence that you would expect from a museum show. And on the other hand, you have to be also thinking from you know, the point like a, like a public art installation, almost like an intervention, because you're trying to get people to come in and then, you know, converge and then diverge uh, after coming through one of your experiences. So when we think about impact, of course, it's very difficult. It's hard. It's unusual that you'll, you'll do something and then all of a sudden, you know, something gets signed. Or, but, but of course, because it's the World Economic Forum, and because of the quality of people and the, the level, I would say, or rather than quality, but the level of people that we have, but that does happen. And it's been quite extraordinary you know, to, to launch projects and in, in some, some cases see impact that we had never even anticipated, either because the works get taken on by different organizations that then take them on to other contexts or for, you know, the work to be part of a broader narrative. For example, this year and the year before in Davos, we had this wonderful piece called Tree VR, which is this incredible work by Melissa Zek and um, Winslow Porter based in the US. And as, as crazy as it sounds, I mean, you actually become a tree through virtual reality uh it's, mm. it's it's one of those things that's hard again that's hard to explain unless you unless Experience you do it, it. yeah it, you know it's it's kind of again it's like people scratch their heads what what are, what are you talking about you know this but of course we got a thousand five hundred people uh and i'm talking you know household names going through it it's an eight nine minute experience and it was, but it was part of a broader huge conversation about sustainability about the launch of the Trillion Trees Initiatives at Davos this year. So in a way, we'll, we'll think about impact in the way in which what we are curating and producing is part of a broader campaign or broader narrative because you know a business leader or a politician in a place like Davos has meetings, goes to a session, does an interview, does an exhibition, and we see that as part of the kind of overall portfolio of experiences that bring a leader slightly closer to action. So we also don't see it in isolation. We, we want it to be isolated in the sense of... a holistic way. approach for the whole experience of the Davos. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I like, it. I like it what the approach that you said, that you mentioned now, like taking one of the missions of the World Economy Forum and actually, as you mentioned with the trees, um, one trillion, uh, one million trees? Yeah, one trillion, yeah. One trillion, one trillion trees, uh, trees and, you know, kind of give it experience and visual aspect not only talking about it and doing it in the field but also creating it's an interesting approach how you can amplify message and amplify vision not only through just saying that's what we will do and doing it but also letting people be part of the experience you know for me art is a way to present alternatives and i always say that artists are very good at kind of questioning the social norms, the status quo, etc. And they present different opinions, obviously, and possibilities and options in the world. And you also mentioned, and you mentioned it just at the beginning, that you want, in a way, the business leader to live not necessarily with answers, but rather questions. Why do you think it's important to live with questions or kind of thinking mm -hmm. about, or at least living with doubts in a way about the way we perceive the world well i think back at the situation from the past few months you know we left davos on january 25 uh, january 25th you know imagining a world uh, having had all these incredible conversations and i can safely say pretty much no one had anticipated where we would be just a few months later and so as we realize how interconnected things are, as we understand things like the butterfly effect, that you know, one small thing happening in one remote part of the world can have a massive impact on the whole planet, we realize that we need to, first of all, surround ourselves with more of a diversity of thinking. And for me, that's critical. I mean, it's something that has led my journey in, in my career, has been to try to ensure that we foster and we celebrate 
inclusion and diversity because it's a, it's a dignity, because it's what needs to be done wherever we live. We want to make sure that people have the same rights and the same access, but also because it just makes us better. We learn better from people who have different life experiences. But oftentimes, in the structures of power, uh, there's a lot of structural exclusion. And we tend to sometimes be in the same kind of circles of people who may have been educated in the same places, maybe have the same sexual orientation and gender, maybe have the same similar worldview. And then you can get into places where the, the path ahead may seem very clear to you. And then, boom, coronavirus hits you. And you yeah. realize that you're completely unprepared for this. I think artists, in a strange way, artists and the cultural sector have been, could argue, impacted disproportionately by this when you think of the closure of all the exhibitions, the tours. I mean, I think of musicians who derive most of their income from gigs and from the merchandise they sell at gigs, not being able to do any of that. And so there's a, and thankfully in many countries, there's huge ecosystems that are, that are being built. And we're, in fact, we are part of some of those conversations and trying to connect dots. At the same time, artists and the cultural field in a way, are, are more prepared than others in a strange way because yeah. we operate. The cultural fields oftentimes operate um, against the winds of change, against the prevailing. In this case, for example, uh, sort of relentless search for uh, economic liberalism, and because artists and the cultural crowd try to put these things in context, try to challenge, try to speak truth to power, try to imagine new futures. When you're confronted with a new future. You're already, you know, artists and, and not all cultural organizations, but a lot of the artists, I would say, and designers and architects and urbanists and others, uh, perhaps are slightly more able to pivot because they already live in the realm of possibilities where sometimes we, we close off some possibilities because we think this is the path. But the path we've developed either on our own or with people who think like us. The listeners obviously cannot see my face, but I'm smiling from uh, one side to the <laughs> other. Because in one of my latest talks, I spoke about what are some of the things that we need to learn from artists. And one of them is their ability to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty and be able to expose yourself and be vulnerable to the reality. And as you said, kind of adjust while the reality is moving. And the thing about diversity is so, I think, it's in a way lacking in the business world. As you mentioned, you often see companies that are built by people that come in from same cities, study in same business school or study the same even, uh, in a way, I would say, degree. Or, and by that, trying to drive innovation, creativity, etc. While in, in the arts, I think the only common thing is the language of art. All the other aspects are open. Nico, I want to kind of uh, continue our discussion and ask you about the role of art. Now, often in the business world, executives are looking for action, reaction. If I put A, I get B. If I invest that type of uh, or that amount of money, I will get probably that percentage of results. Always we are being measured inputs versus output. But with art, it is almost impossible to do so. Why do you think we always think about action reaction and why in art we cannot actually do it? You know, I think the current three months, the last three months we've had have been for me fascinating in terms of understanding the role of art. In a way, I think many people have missed the ability to go to an exhibition, go to a show, go to, you know, watch a movie at a movie theater. I mean, the things that actually we take for granted, which in many ways, if you accumulate experiences over time, you realize that they usually form a huge part of who you become, right? I mean, the, the books that you read as a kid, the series that you start to love and cherish, the the films, the theater, the, those formative moments, even if you're not a, an art kid, if you want to put it that way, or a kid on an art track, we realize that culture is so fundamental to, to who we are. In this coronavirus period, I found it fascinating to see how much we have longed for that moment of shared experience. And then we've actually filled that gap with, binge consuming online creative content yeah. right we've gone to netflix content and to virtual concerts and in a way it's helped us see and i help many people see that that arts and culture are oxygen for society they are actually the kind of almost invisible force that allow us to actually function and to collaborate and to uh, yeah that enable us to live together and to imagine the possibility together i mean you, you think about some of these incredible big cities in 
sometimes I wonder at the, the wonder of, of the infrastructure that allows these cities, the subways, all these things to make it work in a given day. And I think culture and the arts are the same. They have the same kind of quality in making our lives uh, what they are. And so I think when you, when you think about something so broad, it's difficult to see impact or to see a return on investment. I mean, it's like love, right? I mean, what's the, how do you quantify love? And, uh, but Beautiful. At the same time, I like it. I love it. But it's, I mean, it's like, how, how would you talk about, I mean, we even have trouble talking about how we love someone, right? I mean, so there's, there, it, it reminds us that there are intangibles in life and that in a world that is increasingly about being able to show results, that there are different paradigms. And that, in fact, we live in many different paradigms at once. We live, yeah, we have jobs and we have to deliver, or there's a stock market, there's, there's a global economy, but it doesn't have to exclude. It doesn't have to exclude the, the, the more human, uh, more personal, less intelligible, but not less powerful aspects of our lives. And so for me, there's been a movement, I'd say over the last decade or even more in the, in the arts, in the US in particular and others, to really try to quantify the arts because there's been a lot of pressure from funders to say, well, you know, we're going to give you this money, but you have to reach this many people for your show. And so people will book big blockbuster exhibitions or shows with very famous artists. And, you know, you have to pay for those artists. And so, and you have to pay for those big buildings that you have. And so the tickets, you know, the cheap seats are no longer cheap. I don't know of any major concert hall or place where there are any cheap seats that, yeah. you, that most people can actually afford. And so we've gotten into a space where because we are trying to respond to a certain kind of paradigm, we are sometimes losing the, we are denaturing why we do what we do in culture. So this is a really important time. It's almost ground zero for the cultural community as there's been this pause to be thinking, well, what is it we're doing? Are we actually working in the service of, of the community? Are we working in the service of self-preservation? Um, how do you come to a healthy to a healthy balance where, yes, you are sustainable as an institution financially, but you are first and foremost concerned with enabling a sustainable ecosystem where artists, diverse communities are all uh, and audiences are all engaged in the process of creation, of learning, of exposition, of discussion, so that cultural spaces that were founded with the idea of being spaces of community building can return to that, to that ethos. And um, we're part of many of these conversations with our colleagues um, from the cultural sector, and it's a big moment of soul searching about what it means now to be a cultural institution and to support, actually, we, we realize, to support artists, because all of this content, all of these exhibitions, they all, I mean, except for the, for the core collection of these museums and others, it comes from nurturing and the, the creativity. And it, and it means from a very young age, nurturing the creative confidence and enabling a pipeline where it's not just artists that are creative, but the whole community feels a sense of investment in imagining the future. When I listening to you speaking, it's like I easily I can imagine a business leader speaking about, you know, values and purpose of the company and kind of why we do what we do and how we make sure that we create an environment that people feel fulfilled, that feel that human in it. It's kind of things that I feel that, as you mentioned, we need to go back in a way to the human aspect of it. Obviously, it's bring me to a topic that requires a broader discussion, but what is the role of art in your opinion? Maybe one or two things that you have in mind. Oh, it's you know, it's such a it's such a broad question. I, I, I for me, it's such a fundamental. I think of art now. I think of art as a public good, but I, I think that art as a term is very loaded. Uh, a lot of people will will say, "Why do you need to subsidize art? It's a bunch of rich people who buy and sell a commodity." And uh, other people will think about art as, you know, their kids being creative and imagining the world. So the, the word art means many different things to many different people. And it's been one of the reasons, I think, where, why the arts particularly have, have often fallen by the wayside in some places in terms of the investment. Although now, you know, I mean, it was incredible a few weeks into the coronavirus, Germany put in 50 billion B. Uh, to support small businesses, and that included our small arts organizations and artists. Uh, Switzerland, a tiny country, really, in terms of population, uh, 8 million people, invested 280 million to support artists and small arts organizations. So there's this, this interesting dynamic, again, where we take it for granted when we don't have it, we go back to it. 
But I do think of it as a public good in the sense that it is about creating bridges. It is about getting people in a space of reflection and a space of creation. And for me, that's different, very different from, you know, the, the art as a commodity, which gets bought and sold in, in the art market. And yeah, which I is agree its own, with you. It's, 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 it's its own thing. Um, we work with um, folks who are developing... Uh, who are developing uh, leadership programs for for young artists in South Africa, and I mean these are incredible projects that that can have such an impact on the person's life. So that's in that sense that I think of art, but perhaps the arts with an S, which is more encompassing than the idea of the visual art, uh, the arts as in theater and film and literature and music and all all the arts with a, with a broad A as being a public good. We have to do a better job in the arts community about talking about it that way, rather than only trying to make the case, as, in, as is the case in, in some areas, that the arts have a, an economic benefit. Of course they do. Of course, I mean, look, there's, you know, we realize the creative industries employ millions of people. In some countries, it's 7, 10, 15 percent of the workforce. Um, for me, those are, those are additional points to bring to bear to the importance of what culture is that's not the central point because if that's the central point the problem is that we can be flavor of the month this month but next month an industry will say that they cover 25 percent or 30 percent and so that's gone so they we have to continue to believe in the fundamental value of the arts uh, Art for and then, sake. <laughs> that's also a very loaded term <laughs> you know because, but um because uh, art for art's sake can mean to some people that it's disconnected from society, that it's just, it's just the artist and their creation, and it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't necessarily have a social, a social conscience, and it's, it's just to be sold. And, I, you know, I, I almost don't even want to wade into that, because that is a, that's its own thing. A whole thing. different But, discussion. Yeah, I mean, art for art's sake, yes, in the sense that it's not trying to necessarily... It's like education for education's sake, in that sense. It's like, yes, education and the right kind of education uh, can give you the right kind of jobs, and, but education in its own is a public good. It's a human right. It's about being learning to, to not just to read and to write, but also to develop your creative and your critical thinking skills. And so in a way, there's something very human and fundamental to it. So in that sense, in the, sense, in the same sense as education for education's sake, and not just education so that you can get the best job, which of course is also very important. I'm not debating that. But in that sense, yes, arts for art's sake in, in that context, yes. I think that in the, in the forum, uh, corporate leaders make connections and uh, by osmosis learn about the ideas leading the world into the future. I think that's the whole point. It's kind of a melting point for ideas and opinion. And for me, on a personal level, art was always a path for the future, not only resemblance of the present, but kind of putting or creating the barrier or at least helping us to define the unknown and make it into the known. And artists, in a way, are trained to carve this path and other ways to the future. And you already talk about that and you're already operating around this topic. Can you elaborate how do you see this, this ability of artists kind of carving the way into the future? Yeah, you know, I mean, let me start by saying that sometimes we, we think that, you know, artists, business leaders collaborate more with artists, they would get better outcomes. I'm not so sure that's necessarily the case, so certainly from a, from a business perspective. I mean, you've got some extraordinarily brilliant people who run businesses and who run teams and have incredible uh, outcomes to what they do. I think what an artist brings is just a different way of looking at things. And in a way, by making art and the arts less of an instrument towards more productivity, but more as a way to open up a different way of looking at things, that's when a business leader gets the best of both worlds, in a way. So it doesn't mean that necessarily a business leader has to think like an artist. I mean, that sounds nice in concept, but vice versa. It doesn't necessarily mean that an artist has to think like a business person. But by bringing each other in contact, by learning from each other's processes, by understanding the pressures. I mean, you know, for, for me, when we bring cultural leaders to one of our events, they always say to me, the artists, that it's so fascinating for them to understand what's top of mind of these business leaders, to understand the pressures that they're under, to understand that actually it's so much more complex than it might appear from outside, and that people have to do, make trade-offs and make decisions that they know are not 
what they want them to be or perfect, but they they still have to make decisions. And the expression is lonely at the top, you know, because it's it's a complex complex world. And the artists also have their own ways of of thinking in layered ways. And so the extent to which you can find moments for these worldviews or these not even worldviews, but these approaches to mix and merge, not to to mix and match, I would say, would uh, you know can be can be very important. I think the role of imagination is critical. There was actually a Harvard Business Review article that came out just a couple of months ago, which was saying, actually, in this time with coronavirus, it'll be normal for most leaders, business or others, to get into a kind of siege mentality, fight or flight response, which, which is natural, right? I mean, your business might go under, you, you, have, you have salaries to pay, so that's normal. But that it's really important in this moment in time when there's so much uncertainty. And oftentimes when there's so much uncertainty, the tendency could be to just retreat and wait and see, which is perhaps also the right approach. Um, but this art, HBR article was saying, you know, this is the time to actually think about the things that we could not think about before. So, you know, what can we do now that we could not do before? And I don't mean that in a flippant way. I mean that, like, you know, you have those pressures. You have salaries to pay. You have uh, your company to stay afloat. Can you actually now use that moment to use your creative uh, power to think in areas that you had never thought about before? This is where, you know, collaboration with other sectors, bringing in artists, that's when it can be helpful because it's it's about a mindset. So in that sense, I think imagination is very, you, you see it as very useful in times like these. Like we need to think totally out of the box. I mean, most of us have yeah. no idea how this is going to pan out. So for me, this time is stretching my creative output more than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And I still feel like I don't know what's going on. All the consultancy firm and thought leaders, everyone's speaking about reimagining, imagining, thinking about the future. And I think exactly that's kind of, I agree with you. I don't think that a business leader need to be an artist, just like I don't want an artist to be a business person. I want them to have this conversation so we can be better. And one of the things that you also talk about, it's not only imagination, is also creating narratives. How do you see narratives and what is the importance of narratives in art and, and why do you think it's relevant for business? You know, I think narrative is one of those forces that is, again, invisible, but that has a huge impact on our lives and society and how economies work. You even have Robert Schiller, the Nobel Prize winner, who talks about economic narratives. And this kind of grew out in the last few years of this idea that, you know, there is no homo economicus. There, there isn't really this idea that people act rationally and in their, in their, in their own interest. You know, that was debunked uh, several years ago to say, well, actually, we're all we're animals and we, we make decisions based on feelings and based on things that sometimes are short term. And a lot of that is fed by narratives. It's narratives that we start to believe in, the things that become just the leitmotiv of our, of our lives, of the things that we just take for granted. And so narratives are incredibly powerful. And this is why also culture is so powerful, because culture is one of the main reasons uh, how we create narratives. And think about issues of inclusion and diversity. When uh, people of color or women talk about their, how they're depicted in film over 40, 50, 60 years, you start to realize, on the one hand, yes, maybe that's a reflection of society. But you can, equally, you could argue that these are reinforcing images and narratives that create the social contract between people. And so these great movements for social equity uh, have tried to break uh, these so deeply entrenched narratives, uh, which we take for granted, which we take flippantly, which can come across in a comment or in a way that we do things um, and that, in fact, contribute to structural exclusion continuing. And so narratives are, in a way, are the, are the, is where some of these battles for hearts and minds get, get won or lost. You have the evidence, you have the science, you need to be able to demonstrate things. Uh, but without the narrative, without having uh, a group of people imagine a different kind of way of seeing the world, I don't think we move forward. One example is uh, one artist that we work with, Wanuri Kahiu. She's just an incredible artist. She's a filmmaker, and um, she's from Kenya. And she made a film called uh, Rafiki. And Rafiki is the story, it's a, love of, it's a lesbian love affair. It's a love affair between two women. It's a beautiful film, and it was banned by the government. For because it was, uh, I believe it was, it was sort of indecency rules. It was considered indecency rules. But interestingly, it wasn't banned because it was a gay film. It was banned because it was a gay, joyous film. Because mm. 
there was no redemption in the film because the, mm. the, these two women who love each other actually are joyful. And Wanuri decided to fight the ban um, mainly because, and she said, if people who are gay and lesbian don't see themselves ever anywhere rep represented in a way or in a manner of living that they can identify with. So in other words, if all the narratives of people who are gay are tragic, uh, how are we ever going to, as a community, uh, change imagine the perception that, about it, yeah. that it's possible? Yeah. So, you know, narratives are just, just, just fundamental. And, you know, there's their campaigns. Um, but I think narrative, for me, what I've learned is narratives need to be embraced by a lot of people for them to perdure and then become movements. Uh, a campaign only goes so far. It, can, it maybe raises awareness. It still has impact. But it might die down after a while because the next crisis comes over. When there's an upsurge and when people start to see themselves represented and when people st start to see injustice and feel ownership for that injustice, even if it's not from... And that, then I think you, you, you start to shift. You know, there's this term in economics called the, the Overton window. And it was, it was coined, well, it's coined based on this guy Overton, who was a, a lobbyist, uh, and who basically said to, and he was a conservative lobbyist, and he said, look, in order for you to pass legislation that currently seems too extreme, you need to get the conversation along to the place where by the time you're positioning this legislation, it doesn't seem extreme. And yeah. so in other words, you actually have to be more, much more extreme now in what you say and what you do so that when you're ready to put your legislation, it's within the window of, of acceptable discourse. So it's very strategic. And people on the left use it, people on the right use it by saying sometimes outlandish, or what seems like outlandish, policies but then by making that thing outlandish when you say something that's slightly less outlandish it actually seems a bit more reasonable <laughs> and so you know these are all part of narrative shaping narrative building and, and, and you did um, something about it because you took the importance of narrative and you created the narrative lab which by the way i love the name narrative <laughs> lab can you tell us a bit about what is the narrative lab why you created it what you expect it to happen Yeah, this was actually an idea of uh, Lynette Warworth, who is one of our most cherished, closest collaborators and, and uh, an extraordinary artist, one of, one of the great artists uh, of this world. Lynette saw firsthand uh, through collaboration that we had and, and presenting some of her, her works, in fact, commissioning and well producing some of her works, which have gone on to have incredible impact on, on legislation and garnering Emmy Awards, etc. She saw how having access to the World Economic Forum, and if you were able to, to bring high-quality work, you could really help shape narratives. And she, she, you know, but we did this in an ad hoc way. I mean, basically, you create an exhibition or installation, and then you hope that there's some sort of impact. But so we tried to be more deliberate about it. And so uh, over the course of several years, uh, in collaboration with the Ford Foundation, which has provided major funding for this, we've developed what we call the New Narratives Lab. And this was intentionally, it's intentionally a, program. It's a leadership program, basically, that supports wonderful artists. I mentioned Wanuri Kahi just now. She's one of our fellows who are incredible artists, but are from and are from underrepresented communities, which oftentimes mean that they just don't have the access and the resources that others may take for granted. And we've chosen and selected people who have a leadership desire and who show leadership uh, capability. If we can support the leadership, it's not an artistic journey as much as the leadership journey of these incredible artists to help them shape narratives that can have incredible impact in their communities and beyond, then we should do that. And so, so this started as a, as a pairing, a sort of a mentor fellow program, you know, which is fantastic. And so, so we've, got, we've got artists, they're, they're, they are all women, uh, they, and they... Most of them have had some experience of the World Economic Forum, so they, they start to know and understand that platform. And we are now, with coronavirus, we've had to shift a lot of our programming, and it's become a, a virtual sort of an online six-month leadership curriculum where we're bringing them in contact with some incredible leaders, some of it for very specific reasons, like media trainings and uh, conflict negotiation training, but also some of it uh, hearing from other leaders who've had to navigate these circles of power in a way coming, quote unquote, from the outside. Because there is a real sophistication to how you shape narratives from circles of power. You know, It's one thing to go and, and shout and say, this is how it should be, and that has its own value. But there's also, uh, in parallel, another way, which is to bring people in, to draw people, to draw leaders into your narrative 
And that is a very sophisticated uh, thing. And so we, we're pairing up these wonderful fellows with very experienced members of the Cultural Leaders Network, people who, who quote unquote, made it in not just in the arts, but in terms of really being at that place at the table where they, they can really influence the conversations with the presidents, with the business leaders. And so it's been an incredible project. It's the first year that we're doing it. And we're learning fast because, uh, of course, coronavirus changes many things, including showing us how important this is. Uh, even more important when we see how coronavirus has exacerbated and has manifested the inequalities. And so when we even more of a commitment to, to supporting these incredible fellows. Well, maybe in the future we can do another kind of podcast with them to hear from them about oh, the Narrative Lab. Absolutely. Um, Nico, before we continue to discuss the role of art in education, why it's important, let's take a short break. Hey listeners, it's Neil. I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. And I wanted to share with you what we are doing at the Artian. As you already understood, our speakers are at the intersection of art and innovation, but they didn't just arrive there casually. They developed their skills, gained knowledge, and more importantly, grew their artistic mindset. Would you like to develop some of these skills, capabilities, or a growth mindset? Then I would encourage you to check our art-based learning experiences. Whether you want to build your leadership skills or your innovation competencies, our training can be just what you are looking for. Visit us at www.theartian.com Thanks for coming back. I'm speaking here with Nico, the head of art and culture at the World Economy Forum. And now we are getting into the topic that often kind of, I think, touches everyone. Because everyone either was a student, either has kids, in their uh, the education system, either they are business leaders that are looking for their uh, future employees and they want to understand the importance of the skills and competencies and capabilities that we develop in the education system. The forum deals quite often with the future of work and the fourth industrial revolution. The forum published a very famous uh, research. I love these beautiful Instagram movies that you do around automation and the fourth industrial revolution. And you kind of constantly explore the skills and capabilities we need. Now, automation enters the work environment and influences many jobs. In a way, I always say we are entering into a decade to up-leveling the human and fulfilling uh, his or her potential. Business leaders agree as well. As the different uh, surveys show, for example, PwC research showed that almost 80% of business leaders find it difficult to find creativity and innovation skills they need. And while we praise and want the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math skills, leaders still see it as important, but they start to emphasize more the soft skills, including creativity as something even more important. And I want to ask you, uh, Nico, what is the role of art in preparing the future workforce? Yeah, look, I mean, this is such a fundamental uh, aspect of, of life and society. And um, in fact, you know, the, the, the future of jobs report on the forum from 2018 showed that uh, I think it was uh, in the list of top 10 skills that CEOs look for in new recruits, creativity came third. I think critical thinking came second. Or I, um, I, I'd have to go back to the report, but it's certainly in the top top three, four were, were some of these skills. Um there's, you know, raging debates about about this, and of course, when when there are budget cuts, uh, art education is the first to go, and it's seen it's seen as uh, not something that you can measure, and it's not seen as as core to the to the STEM uh, disciplines, which of course are so incredibly useful and important for young people to develop skills for the for the future workforce. There has been a movement for more than a decade. Uh, to, to make it stem to steam, to add the A, you know, and, and, and think of the arts as part of that more holistic approach. But even within that, there's been debate because some people say, well, you know, it shouldn't just be that arts education is just about making you be better at maths. Uh, some people say it should because with, the create, with that ability to think creatively, maybe you think about engineering differently and sciences differently. And some people just say, no, it's, it's, part of, it's just part of a better, well-rounded young person to really be comfortable with science and be comfortable with arts. And because we don't know what the world is going to be like, but we, what we perhaps do know is that we need people who are, um, well, some people to be slightly less quote unquote experts and more generalists, more having that beginner's mindset. And that beginner's mindset is really hard to have, especially when you become good at something. 
and when you become an expert. I mean, some of this is some of the some of the issues we have with some of the lack of coordination and some of the response to some of the crisis because you've got certain kind of experts and other kinds of experts and people. It's it's it, you know it's a human nature as you become better and better at something, and uh, it's hard to then adopt that kind of humility to say, oh, I hadn't I hadn't I thought know. about this or this. Yeah. So I think you know. Um, I hope you know the coronavirus crisis. If anything, has shown again the critical importance of teachers. Uh, we, I think, myself included, we we've seen how difficult it is to be a teacher from for for a couple of months, and uh, even more respect to to all the good teachers. Uh, and the work that they do is just so fundamental. And um, I think for kids, it's a, for me, it's about it's about creative confidence. It's about believing that it's possible. You know, we grow up and our, our prefrontal cortex develops and, and then we get into situations where we see that things are actually not likely. Um, and it's very quick that we go into the yes, but. And I think arts education helps nurture the yes, and. It helps, it helps kids believe and understand, believe that not only that, that it's possible, but also that, that they can do it. Whatever their background, whatever, whatever the structure that they have at home, Whatever inequality exists, uh, you know, compared to to peers, uh, it's a it's a way for people to to develop their their confidence. It's also, you know, as we think about diversity, we all express ourselves differently. Uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's considered sometimes disabilities. Sometimes I like to think of it as just different abilities. We, you know, we we are different in how we express ourselves, and some people might you know be more quiet or more shy, but have uh, a way to express themselves through a creative means that is very meaningful and that allows that young person to really develop and to and to to feel like they can make their own space in the world so it, it's really hard to overstate the importance of arts education it is saddening to see whenever there's a budget cut for the yeah. for arts education to be cut i understand the logic of it i understand where the logic comes from i just disagree with the logic um, um, you know, it's it's in a way we're shooting ourselves in the foot as a society by by not supporting young people. You know, the mess that our generation or our parents' generation, grandparents' generation has, have made in, in leading us into a kind of, uh, uh, if you want to put it that way, uh, you know, the the Anthropocene period. Uh, we're gonna. It's actually now on the young people to fix that, and the young people are gonna to fix that. Are in a way gonna have to unlearn how. We've learned because you can't really fix the problems with the same mindset. <laughs> so, yeah. so in a way, it's like double trouble if we don't support young people. And, and for us as a society to be okay for a kid to just find themselves through music or through drama. Because for me, that's what it's about. It's about children feeling like they're part of this world, feeling that there's a place for them in this world. And, uh, and, but of course, combined with the other skills. But it's not exclusive. Uh, it's not exclusive, and I think we want to support the development of well, young, well-rounded, critically thinking, curious minds. And I think the arts are really, really essential to that. Yeah, I remember uh, the two years ago, uh, Jack Ma, the, the founder of Alibaba, probably one of the biggest technology conglomerates uh, coming out of China, actually, in the forum, they asked him, what do you think is important now in an era of AI? And he actually talked about the art. Maybe we can listen to it. Uh, we have the recording. I think we should teach our kids uh, sports, entertain, uh, uh, the, the music, painting, art. So making sure humans should be different from everything we teach should be different from machine. If the machine can do better, you have to think about it. Education, it's a good, big challenge now. If we do not change the way we teach, 30 years later we'll be in trouble. Because the way we teach, the, the thing we talk, teach our kids, are the things in the past 200 years is knowledge based. And we cannot teach our kids to compete with machine who is smarter. We have to teach something unique. That is machine can never catch up with us. Nico, so we are getting into the end of our hour of conversation. And I think that one of the topics I want to discuss with you before we finish is leadership. I think that we are seeing in the last few months with the pandemic, with uh, the elections that come in, is that we need leaders and we need positive leadership more than ever. And one of the things that you do at the World Economy Forum is that you have the Global Leadership uh, Fellow Program 
And few years back, together with the Columbia University School of the Arts, you actually created a program for those leaders. Maybe you can share with us why to bring Columbia University of the Arts, why to bring arts into the future leaders, and how you actually see the role of art in leadership in, in the world. Yeah, that's actually a wonderful initiative that actually predates me in, in collaboration with the wonderful Carol Becker at, at Columbia, the dean there. Uh, we have a, a program at the forum called the Global Leadership Fellowship Program, where people come and they, they work. And there's also, a, as part of their time at the forum, they're also basically getting the equivalent of a degree in leadership. And I think it was a brilliant, radical move to bring, there's, a, there's one work, there's one week which happens at Columbia where these, these forum employees who, you know, cut across, some of them are on the business side, some of them are environmental activists, uh, some of them are scientists. Uh, come in contact with some leading artist and do do a week long series of workshop, and I think a lot of it is <laughs> a lot of it is about finding the self. It's about finding an authentic self, and so it's using these creative means that sometimes put people a little bit out of their comfort zone, uh, but that forces them to you know to to look at themselves in a different way, and and with the belief that that is then the spur for them to continue their career grounded grounded in in a sense of why they do what they do so i think that's the value of that program and it's been very successful and it's something that our global leadership institute and carol have have spearheaded and and, you know has been a a wonderful um project i think in general what i've learned (laughs) what i've learned in, in meeting business leaders and others is that leadership is hard it's really hard and you know in my own growth as a as a manager and then leader of team you know it's these are th- these are skills that are that are hard, and I think the more we are open to different forms of leadership, the the more we surround ourselves. I I I come back to this because I what I've found over time is that I think I think a smart leader, uh, in addition to everything else, surrounds themselves with brilliant people, uh, including people that are maybe better than them, and people who just have different ways of looking at the world, and sometimes means that it's. It can mean that it's harder to make a decision or that they, it brings too much more complexity. But I, I do think that a leader can make better decisions when they are surrounded with people who have, um, who have different life experiences. So not just opinions, but also life experiences. And this is where the structural diversity and inclusion is so critical to having decisions that are, that are, that are inclusive, that are not tone deaf, that are long term, uh, you know, to the extent that one can. And I think again, you know, when you when you bring artists and, and people who, you would think, why is art related to leadership? But again, if you imagine leadership in a broad sense, in terms of like leading opinion or leading people, and you think about the role of narratives and who it is that has a huge amount of power to shape narratives, you see that artists are leaders. They are leaders of society. Totally. And again, I'm talking talking about the artists uh, in the sense of the artists who are creating work that is shaping public opinion. I mean, that is one of the f- highest forms of leadership. So we're getting into the end of our uh, conversation. Obviously, you summarized so many beautiful things about why I think everyone should engage with art. And from my personal perspective, why business uh, leaders and entrepreneurs should engage with the arts, the imagination, how to look at love. I love this uh, metaphor, how we can measure love. A beautiful one. I kind of uh, want to ask you maybe something personal. What is memorable encounter that you had during the different um, exhibitions, conversations, workshops that you had at the forum that touched you or, you know, kind of left an impact on you? Thanks for asking. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've i just been so fortunate in this job. I've been here almost almost eight years and I, I it's just been incredible internally. The, the brilliance of the people that you work with and how you grow, again, from, from different, different life circumstances. And then the experiences that we've had been able to, to create. I think the, probably the one that's most resonant for me and that in a way changed, changed me significantly was when we produced the first international tour of the Afghan Women's Orchestra. And um, it was a monumental project that was quote unquote impossible because, you know, bringing, bringing a group of uh, 35 underage uh, Afghan women to Europe and getting visas for them. And, um, but we, we knew about their work. Um, we knew the founder of the school where they, where they grow. Uh, and we, we f- in talking about leadership, they were demonstrating such incredible leadership. You know, they're playing music in a, in a context where 
even though it's not illegal anymore, it's frowned upon where there's often acid attacks, where there are, uh, there's a big uh, security concern and playing music, is, is, and especially by women, is just seen as something that is, let's just say it's very, very dangerous and, and there have been incidents against musicians and, and especially uh, women musicians. So for them to do that and to, uh, again, to create the narrative that, of the possibility for other young women that this was possible, we wanted to bring that form of leadership in contact with the kind of leadership we have in Davos. We wanted to have that, that, that moment, that electric moment, and we did. And we brought the Afghan Women's Orchestra to, to Davos, but not just to Davos, because we again wanted it to be an opportunity, not just for world leaders, but also for European public. So then we produced an entire tour, which, uh, which went around Germany and around Switzerland, where there was um, collaboration with local musicians, school concerts. Um, and so we used, we leveraged the, the forums in a way influence to make this tour happen. We produced this tour, which is really difficult to pull off, but we had the right contacts to help us and the right expertise. And it, it just had a huge impact on me personally, just this being so awed by these women and also realizing before, during and after that this, you know, these are, these are real lives. These are not just concepts. You know, these people have to go back home. And when they go back home, they have to deal with families and they have to deal with the media and they have to do, and, and they knew that. And, and so the, it really felt like a historic moment where, where uh, especially from the side of these girls, they were really putting themselves out there uh, yeah. to make that moment. And it, it was just the most, perhaps the most beautiful project I've ever been involved in. And uh, I still look at, you know, you were asking about leadership. I just look at the courage uh, that these women demonstrate. And, and, you know, that's one of the great, things about great leaders is the courage because that is real courage what they do they know that they can at any time uh, be gone basically to do what they do but they believe in it and they want to inspire other people and the impact of it was you know, from a global perspective incredible it was it became a global media story um, from an actual impact uh, it, it really I think for these young women opened their eyes to many new new things they hadn't been out of their country for most of them or if they had it and been in the region but it also had a huge impact on these leaders, on their local communities that met with them uh, over really meaningful encounters, over dinners and workshops. And then it had a big impact on the country. There were national news when they came back. You know, some went on to have careers as TV hosts as a result, and some uh, you wow. know, were taken back by their family and said, never again. So it was, it was real. It's real life. You know, when we think about the arts, we have to remember that it's real life. It's, it's not just a concept. It's not just an idea. It's not just a pastime. It's, it's how we grow. Uh, in our creative confidence, it's how we shape narratives. It's how we end up making decisions based on the things and the accumulation of experiences that we've had. And so, so that for me was a was a great reminder of the power of the arts. Wow! I mean, I think there's no better uh, ending for this uh, conversation with such uh, example for courage, for beauty, for the role of art. Nico, it was a great pleasure to talk to you and learn from you uh, how art is part of the World Economy uh, Forum. I'm positive that the work your team and you are doing will help foster the role of art and the importance of art. For everyone that uh, is interested, we will put the links to your website so people can follow about your uh, great work. And I want to say thank you for the fact that you show people that art does matter. Thank you so much, Nir, for, for hosting this, this really important program and, and for inviting me to, to share. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you very much. We are producing our podcast without any ads, and we are relaying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website www.derteyan.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
and you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.